Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is a podcast where we explore how the best B2B sales leaders make the complex simple, drive relationships and revenue, and generally elevate the sales profession. In this podcast, we're bringing together sales experts, thought leaders, top account executives, buyers, industry insiders, all to share their experiences and best practices for navigating the complex sales cycle. So whether you're a seasoned sales professional, a sales leader, or just starting out, you're going to find practical insights and actionable advice that you can apply to your own sales journey. Plus, we have a bit of fun. Today, I'm joined by Ed Porter, founder of Blue Chip CRO. Ed operates as a fractional CRO, transforming critical revenue challenges into growth opportunities for emerging businesses. He got to this point with continual persistence, trial and error, a systems mind, and a leader's heart. He's been recognized as a three-time top 25 most influential sales leader, executive of the year, one of the top 100 sales coaches to watch, and many other awards. With a stellar record of leading diverse teams, Ed's story is a gold mine for any company interested in growth. So let's get growing. Ed, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I am awesome. It's good to see you as always. Well, I get to see you. Everybody else doesn't get to see you, but it's good to see you. Yes. Like I said, I got I got a face built for podcasting. This is wonderful. <laughs> I don't have to be on camera. Well, hey, man, we've been planning this for a while. And what I'm really excited about is you told me that you're listening. You're binging this stuff, which is great. It's true. I, you know, I'm definitely a fanboy out right now for a little bit, but, uh, you know, when, when it started off, you know, I wanted to tune in if, you know, I know you, so I want to support. And now I'm just, I'm rearranging my podcast episodes on the what's next. And I'm like, what more is there? So I'm loading yours up, uh, up front. I mean, you got a great guest that are just talking about great stuff. And I love this conceptual challenge because we're all facing it, right? It's it's mm-hmm. sales is hard and how are we doing it? And there's tactics, but I just like hearing from different people that you talk to. And I just think the content in this is great. So yes, definitely a fan and, and happy to be participating. That's awesome. Hold on one second. Hey hon, hey hon, I got a, I got a uh I have one. I got a fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm, kidding. I'm, the, I'm the only one. I'm the only one, I guess. <laughs> Actually, it's getting great listenership. We love it. I, this is like, I was talking to somebody right before this, actually. It was I had a killer sales call. It was so much fun. And I finally realized, and they told me that they listened too. And I finally realized why I like doing this so much is I get to be, I don't have to be an influencer. I don't have to do anything. I get to be a learner. And so I get to meet awesome people and learn. And so one of the things I'd like to learn from you is we're going to start with this conceptual framework, right? So we're going to dive into the, the, the regular thing, what is sales? And then you take a little bit of a different approach to that as a CRO. So we're going to dive into that. And I want to know how your background. So let's start with a regular question that starts the art and science of complex sales. What, what is sales to Ed Porter? Yes, sales to me is helping buyers make the best buying decision. And I think this is Something I've learned over the years, there's a pretty influential book that I read years ago by an author named Jeffrey Lipschitz called Selling to the Point and talks about the whole purpose of selling is buying. So it kind of gets you to reframe everything about the buying process and the buyer specifically. And you know, it's hard for sellers, especially commission salespeople, to take themselves out of the equation, but to really understand the buyer, where they're at, and then help them make the best buying decision, which may not be you. So that's my definition of sales is helping buyers make the best buying decisions. Well, I think you just summed up something that uh, that, that's a really great summation. The whole point about selling is buying. Dive into that a little bit more because there's a lot to buying these days. Yes. Right. And, uh, the frequency of the Amazon driver coming to my house would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of buying. There is. I mean, th- but there's a lot to it too. Like we're at a, we're at this stage and maybe we'll jump into this a little bit early. We're at this stage where, especially in the complex B2B sale, right? That the buyer has so many resources, so many choices, so many points they have to ask and so much uncertainty around them about that, right? Because if, if you have one point of view and finally come to the decision, there's there's 72 people online plus in your own organization that are going to give you a different point of view and you're taking a risk of being right. So 
what are the things that you're finding these days as a CRO? And let's start at that point that that really help people drive that that buying decision. Yeah. So this and this is what um, I like about some of the meat in the episodes you have is the the whole name of the show is you know the art and science of complex sales. And when you get into complex sales, it's exactly right. Is the the larger buying committees start to form, and everybody has an opinion often narrow, a very narrow opinion. So it's what your one seller, maybe you've got potentially an engineer or product expert next to you, maybe a boss that's coming in, but ultimately you're going to be outnumbered by how many people in the buying committee compared to how many people are in the selling committee, if you will. So the that's very hard to to navigate. And this is where there's no one easy formula. There's no one recipe. There's just no one playbook for all of this stuff. So what I, what I really think about the landscape is a, we're looking at a, a, a bigger challenge that won't get solved uh, any easier. won't make selling any easier, which is it's harder to access buyers. Number one. And number two, it's becoming much more, the seller or the, I'm sorry, the buyer is doing their own research ahead of time. They're getting referrals. They're getting doing consults ahead of time. You're not even in the picture before most of the buying decision is already underway. So how do you then navigate that landscape? So when you're in a room, be it virtually or, or, or on site, it's navigating those different personas. So you got to know who your committee is and you got to know what's important to them. And just because you're a, a buyer, a CFO at a $100 million a year company in a manufacturing industry, that doesn't mean that CFO at one company meeting those demographics is facing the same challenges or at the same point in time as another one. They could look identical on paper, but you don't treat them the same. If you go into a playbook, you got to be able to deviate from it. So when you talk about challenges as a whole is how do you access buyers like that? This is exactly what marketing is there for is how do you get on their radar? And then once you are on their radar, how do you nurture those conversations down the path? And, you know, there's, I I certainly am not going to be given the winning lottery numbers to that equation today, but this is where a podcast like this and, information out there exists because there's different ways to do that. And some are successful, some are unsuccessful. But ultimately, I, I, the advice that I always give to everyone is test, test, test. And just recognize that once you find something that works, know that it's not going to work forever. So you're going to have to constantly adapt. The playbook has to be fluid. It has to be dynamic, ever-changing. And just don't put a playbook on a shelf whether it's a digital shelf or a file in a storage cabinet, or even you know building these processes that you guys build through membrane is, it's got to be a living, breathing process with constant iteration, constant review, because the buying landscape changes, the buyer changes. Inevitably, your product or service can change, and you, you just have to keep going with that. So I don't know if that's a roundabout way but, or an indirect way to answer that question, um, but it's just constant iteration. I think it's a, no, I think it's a, a great way. I think it's, um, I'm going to dive back because I want to give people some context about how you get to that answer. Cause I think it's a great answer. And I do think, well, I know, right. As a, as a practitioner, as well as learning from everybody, I know that it's not just the, Hey, I'm, I'm a CRO. I'm going to drop in. I have this amazing framework and guess what? You're going to do it. Right. That's the biggest way to instantaneous failure. Or just because I did it over here and it worked amazing, right? <laughs> it's going to absolutely work the exact same way over here, and that's a hunk of flaming, you know, poo. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. So, tell me about your journey. I think this is going to be really interesting for the. I know it's going to be really interesting for the audience. Where did Ed start, and how did Ed get to be, uh, you know, a fractional CRO, running a, a strong newsletter, running, being a thought leader in the, the industry, et cetera? Yeah, thank you. The, I, I started off my career in the outsourced call center space. So I was in college and I needed a part time job while I was in college. And a friend of mine was working somewhere. So I got a job answering phones part time. And it was, it was a rough go. But um, I started there and really 
liked it. I worked my way up. So I was in school and working had an opportunity to become full-time and was a supervisor role and kind of just took the reins from there. So I started at 19 and was, was a call center rep. And by the time I was about 23, 24 years old, I had pushing a thousand people re- reporting up to me across multiple locations. Gosh. It was a uh, wow. sink or swim. It was very fast paced, working with different clients, uh, doing different things. And Can I stop I, you for a second. You just said yeah. a thousand people reporting to you. Yes. Multiple <laughs> locations. How do you do one-on-ones in that situation? Yeah, right. Well, that's the, like, that's the whole hierarchy. So I learned a lot, you know, call center, it's a service business, but there are a lot of manufacturing disciplines that are applied. When you look at Six Sigma process adherence, process creation, and, and things like that, I was fortunate to go through a Six Sigma certification during that time, which I got in early 2000s. And um, you really start to understand creating a process, following a process, adhering to a process, understanding deviations, and then figuring out how do you make improvements. And there's a, a way to make improvements. So it was it really triggered the analytical side of my brain pretty well. And then as I rose up the ranks, it's managing people. People are your product at that point. So it's managing a lot of people. And it was very much sink or swim. That was the whole gamut. So you start to learn. What I started to learn a lot was span and control and understanding reporting hierarchy relationships, roles, responsibility, definition. How do you align it? How do you structure it? How do you improve it? When you look at supporting and enablement departments and teams, how do you run those? How do you afford them? What ratios do you run? How do you bake it into full costs? I mean, this is this is right in your wheelhouse, Paul, from, from your prior life. But I, I was very fortunate to have this experience. I had great opportunities. I had great leaders that believed in me. And I got to learn on the job. So I was very young in my early to mid-20s that really formed a lot of what I believe today. And you know that kind of started started the whole process for me. So I, I, was, I did that. And I did that for eight years. I got to go over to the Philippines for a little while. And there was a 2000 employee call center ran over there. I worked with the VP for a while to kind of help streamline some operations. So I got that experience. Um, I got experience working with a multitude of different clients and needs, doing outbound sales, inbound sales, inbound support, tech tier one, tier two technical support. Um, I got to work with a client that was innovating and building a brand new product category. That was really neat. So I got experience wow. on the marketing side very well. Um, cause we were doing sales service and support for that client. So it was, it was a great exposure to a lot of different things. So it, it was a great foundation for my career. So that, that is, ab- that had to be absolutely critical to be able to then take, I, I get it now. I get it a lot more now, <laughs> right. To be able to take that six Sigma approach and be able to systemize, but then, then operate I always say it's the system is the easy part, right? The framework is the easy part. It's the it's the people within the framework and the execution on an ongoing basis that is the really that's the difficult, right? Yes, and it's, it's it's that. So building sales teams and building become a chief revenue that's that had to be very natural to you. It started so it it definitely started there. What you know from there, I went to a, a software company. People that I worked with at the call center spun off and did built their own call recording software platform. So I got to know those those people very well. And I went to go work there doing something completely different, which was building a channel division. And their theory, which turned out to be a pretty good one, was Ed, you're a you're a contact center leader and we're trying to build reseller partners that are selling to contact center leaders. You are the persona that they're selling to and they need help training so to present our product so we figure you're going to help you can help those sales people understand the buyer persona very well and then you can help build this channel program so that was the theory i knew nothing about channel i, I even asked them like what what's channel selling so um, i had to learn a lot about distribution learn about reseller uh, var value added reseller um, is is a thing and I had to learn about that years ago mm-hmm. So still in the contact center space, but certainly learned a lot more about marketing and selling because when you sell to a partner, as you probably know, is 
you have to sell twice. So you have to get the partnership and then you have to figure out how to engage the partner to get them to sell. And mm-hmm. you have to, you have to sell a lot. It's, it's a lot of training, a lot of education. You got to stay in front. You got to figure out joint marketing efforts and you have to ultimately try to build a community of end users that are, are driving revenue opportunities through partners. So, so that was the other side that I started to learn was the pure marketing channel selling and supporting partners throughout that venture. So that kind of was the other side of it that helped to kind of shape a little bit more about where I am today. From there, I went to go build an inside sales team for a large field sales organization that was trying to figure it out. And they had a competitor that was getting up there in the market and they only really had an inside sales team. So they wanted to figure out this inside sales thing. So this was at the time... I, I built an inside sales team of full cycle sellers. They did hunting, they did farming, they did service, they did it, they did credit and collections. I mean, they did wow. everything. The sales team did everything for that customer. So that was another pretty formative uh, point in my career that helped shape the roles and responsibilities. Who does what? How do you optimize time? And when you start looking at, you know, I simplify this into a pie chart of all the different activities involved where you get to the point where a salesperson only spent 30, 35% of their time selling. The rest of the time was non-selling activities. And you start to optimize that. How do I improve that? And that's in a full cycle seller. Um, it's extremely important to optimize that whole process so that pipelines are full, that things that deals are being closed, and ultimately that customers continue to buy and keep buying. So it was a, it was a, a great venture um, went from zero to forty million in about eight years, so it was a good, a good track. Um, in fact, right now I, I still talk to a lot of the people um, in that for the, that team in that company. My former boss is now the president of the company, and uh, you know the, the inside sales team is now well into the hundreds of millions um, that their wow. revenue responsibilities. So they're doing great things, and but that was a great support in my kind of overall leadership mentality of really understanding the full buyer life cycle and knowing how do you do this from the buyer perspective and then how do you optimize from the seller perspective. So that was that was kind of my time there that that reshaped more on the call center world, the channel world, now the full cycle seller world. Um, and then I went to go become the CRO of a company that had aspirations of getting acquired. And they were going through a little bit of stagnation. So we got the company sold. So turned things around, got the company sold. And then I didn't know what I was going to do after that. And uh, here I am four years later, still kind of trying to figure it out. But I got myself in a niche, a niche pretty well. And um, here we are as a, as a fractional CRO. I'm going to dig into one particular point of that uh, journey. So I, like anybody listening to that is uh, like, it is an encyclopedia. You sit down with Ed and you get to learn everything about a whole lot of stuff, but he, he crystallizes it really well into, into really the parts of the sales cycle and how you impact the customer. And also one of the things I've always appreciated about our conversations is diving into that people side. So when you're that inside when you're that inside rep, you're growing that team from you know zero to forty million, I think is what you said, and then they're they then they're growing up and on. But they're a full cycle, full cycle rep. What are the processes that you're using to to dive in to help them understand? Okay, actually, yeah, it is only thirty five percent of the time that we're using. Helping to coach them and train them to get that to you know forty five percent to that next level, like. How are you conceptualizing that? How are you crafting that? And then how are you actually working with the reps to make it happen? Yeah, that, I mean, that's. I, I wish I had a clear answer for that. I didn't. It was just a lot of let's try this, and mm-hmm. um, you know, certain things started to evolve. I, I much like about what you talk about with a lot of guests is is books, and you start to find out how do you go find information and. That was me. I was the constant student to figure out how do you build inside sales teams to optimize what technology is being used to help support and enable what kind of coaching and training do you need? And it was a, it was a journey that we started doing. So I, I would say the one thing that kind of kept me going was in the sales world, you know, there's a, there's this philosophy that salespeople are coin operated and money motivating. I'm the opposite of that. 
I am my own critic. I am motivated by my own self-worth, self-drive. I want to be successful myself. And that's a bigger driver to me than any extrinsic outcome that I can receive. So for me, it was a pride thing. It was coming into, you know, in, in several operations, I was building from scratch. So for me, it was not only do I want to figure it out, but I was also building an inside sales team. And I was, for lack of a better word, the stepchild of the organization. Field team was priority number one. They had been these, these sales guys have been doing this forever. They had been territories for 20, 25 years. Coming in, I'm, I'm immediately the enemy. And most often I did very much compete with a lot of them. And, and it was awful. So I had a bit of an ego to say, I want to, I want this to be successful. So that was my drive. And it was more so, how do I do what they're doing? And then how do I do it better? And my proclamation during that whole time was field reps were, they were in the car, they were driving, they had local territories within two, three hour drive radius from where they lived. So I had a huge advantage, which was I didn't have windshield time. So it was all optimizing on time. I wound up engaging a consultant that helped us develop our first playbook. So shout out to Dion Meyer, who uh, is, is now back at it now in the game. Um, but she, I met her through the AAISP and she helped us put our first playbook together. The antithesis of it was was chunking time. And as simple as that sounds, it was scheduling time and having reps schedule on their calendar, blocking off prospecting time, blocking off service time, blocking off email, checking email time, blocking off um, credit and collections time, blocking off administrative tasks. And when you start to... And it's less about you know, following that to a T and more about preparing for it. Because even if you're 50% successful, that's still 50% better than you were yesterday or the day before. So it's a constant continual improvement. So I that's what ultimately we started to focus on was how do we group the tasks together? And then how do we block time to complete those tasks? And that's how optimization started to ensue. So then it became make sure there's time to prospect and fill the pipeline, make sure there's time to follow up on the current pipeline and close deals, make sure there's time to service top customers and requests and make sure you're on it, make sure we're getting our money. So all of these things, when you look at that full buyer life cycle, all of those things got chunked into those that calendar time. And that just became what we optimized and we continued to operate. So that was the hardest thing to do. And you know that was a culmination of, again, hiring an outside consultant to help with that and put that into place. And that I even use that today. I had a client call a couple months ago where we put that into place. I said, here's the activities we need to chunk and really start to figure out. And it's a great, it's a great recipe and a playbook. You had to have a hell of a, I mean, there's, there's something you're not talking about that I'm assuming, right? Which is you had to have a hell of a culture. Like you had to, that had to be, instead of getting compliance from people, it sounds like to go from zero to 40, right? You're not getting compliance. You're not getting, oh yeah, I kind of want to do this. You had to have a really strong team, a, a commitment. How did that factor in? I, were you bringing reps in to figure this out together? I mean, were you doing it with a team? How did you go about that? Yeah. Great. And I, and I, you're right. I, I can probably talk about this for a while too, is um, the art of enrollment. And it's not about a leader saying, I'm the new sheriff in town. Here's what we're doing. But how do you enroll people? You know, there was a, anyone that's worked for me will know that I like to argue. And it's not argue in, into being right as much as it is trying to find the right decision. So I'm very much not, not a consensus person, but I like to brainstorm. So I don't know the front lines. I was farthest removed from the front lines. So I, I needed people like that. So I was fortunate to have some team members. As I, you know, as I came into this position, I was building from scratch. So one of the people that I was able to bring on to the team was somebody who was an existing field rep who worked in the Columbus area that she came, came in and w- was kind of our lead. So I had a lot of experience to lean on through her, which was great. And as we continued to build the team, we had some different experiences that helped mold that team. So that helped. Beyond that, it was very much, I was asking, you know, what do we do? How do we, 
how do we segment activities? How do we block them? How do we go execute? But ultimately, it was very much a, even when we developed the playbook, it wasn't like, go execute all 30, 40 pages of this playbook. It was very much, let's start and let's start to build a rhythm of success, start to implement, start to get the wins, start to change the habits and commit to memory. And it was very much a slow and steady. And you'd be surprised, or maybe not surprised, but when uh, when you start to see success in something new, that's what's motivating. So once people started seeing successes and they would bring it to the huddles, it started to catch and then they would continue doing more and more. So it was it was just trying to create that momentum where people are seeing success from the work that's that they're you know the behavior that they're changing and the the work that they're producing to help continue to fuel that. So that's what it's that's the epitome of change, right? Change is hard, mm-hmm. but if you start change is easier when you start to see the successes that are coming from change, then you're more committed and you're engaged and you keep going. So long story less long is I I don't want to attribute too much to culture. Um, as much as I want to attribute that to the individual people, because in order to build a culture, it is about the individual people. And the team that I had, I was very fortunate that they're hard workers um, from different walks walks of life. You know, not everybody had sales experience. Not everybody had certain experience. It wasn't a cookie cutter type of environment. It, it was focused on the team members and they were the ones carrying out the the, the, the duties. So I think they did great and it just became this success momentum. So, you know, there were, there were struggles of course, along the way, but ultimately change is hard and mm-hmm. you have to see the benefits of change in order to stay committed to that change. And that's, that was a little bit intentional because I knew it wasn't going to be overnight. So it was, let's start small, let's get a few wins, start changing small things once at a time, and then try and throw a little bit more at you, a little bit more at you. And then, you know, that's how, that's how you go. And that's the benefit of this, like, you know, everybody throws around hockey stick growth. So when you start looking at the hockey stick, don't overestimate the amount of time that it takes to stay flat, because that should be all the learning that should be getting the materials ready, getting the training ready so that when it does take off, it can go fast. And that's exactly what happened. I think it took, you know, I was there eight years. I don't think we got to 10 million until five years in so Mm -hmm. you know that was long it it was a long time first year was 1.3 million second year we doubled so we were right at two six and then you know it it, so it it took a long time so that that hockey stick didn't really get developed until year four or five yeah and i always say like you get the 10 year overnight successes which is generally the 10 year i mean that it always is because you're building the foundation I'm going to make a comment here. I don't know if it'll be, I'm not meaning to be uh, directional in this, so it's going to sound like I am, but I, I really don't know how to say it more effectively. But <laughs> top down, bottom up culture is what I what I hear. And then I think people, individuals, right? Individuals build a culture. It's not about, it's not about a culture build it, until you get mass, until you get enough people where, where, you're set and you're moving forward. And that's when that hockey stick goes, right? Is because you have, but that initial investment and, and those initial battles, right? Where you're setting the tone and then everybody else, it's not bottom up because it's not people at the same level. It's just that we're doing different jobs, but taking responsibility for action, making it work, diving in, bringing that stuff back to the huddles. I remember I had a, a guy named Andrew that, that he brought back. It was, it was amazing. He brought back this one thing to a, to a company huddle where he was like, you know what? I got this down. He's like, I got, I know exactly. I built myself a dashboard that I know exactly how many dials it takes for me to make $100, for me to make $500, for me to make $1,000. I know exactly the work I need to put in and, and all this stuff. And and you had people look at him like, oh my God, that is badass, right? It wasn't anything I did. They were looking at him saying, that is badass. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you had worked hard enough to put the structure in place that it, that he's excited and to be able to bring that, right? And people clomped on it. They were like, oh, okay, I'm going to use that method. And then you had, for a time being, you had everybody working like that. It was so cool. So that's what it sounds like you really dove in and were, were able to build. And I tip my hat because that is one of the hardest walks 
that zero to 1.3 to 2.6 is one of the hardest walks. Everybody thinks that it's just so damn hard, right? It's long nights, early days, investing with people, diving in and, um, and figuring it out, which I think is, I keep hearing you say these two things, is figuring it out and then the persistence in figuring it out. And, we don't, and then making a system out of that, just about the things that we figured out. Yeah, um, that's true. It's, that's the, it's, it's the grind, right? Like that's the whole merit in the grind. And you, sometimes you just got to figure it out. You, the metaphor I like to use is sometimes you got to build the landing gear while the plane's in the air, but you can't do that until you get off the ground. So that's, that's kind of the whole, the whole thing of it's okay not to have everything buttoned up and figured out. It's just like, let's go and let's, let's figure out the next step while, while we're still building the previous step. So you're getting into some, some, I'm going to steal that. That might be the the freaking title of this building to landing, building the, uh, (laughs) building the landing landing where the planes in the air, but you need to get off the ground. I think that's brilliant. But let's get into a little bit about uh, what you're seeing today and what you're seeing happen uh, kind of in this in this space that you're living in right now, which would you talk about that a little bit and some of the challenges you're seeing being the as a chief revenue officer in the spaces that you're operating? Yeah. So the I mean, the overwhelming <laughs> mantra, I guess, of as I've been doing this for the past, I've been on my own for a little over four years now has been. Everybody has what they'll consider a sales problem, but rarely is it actually a sales team functionality to fix. So, you know, there's there's really a couple core things. It's either we need a new pipeline, we need the pipeline to close, or we need to keep the customers. So coming to some of those, like the challenges that are getting a lot bigger right now over the past few years, call it COVID, call it anything you want. I don't know the reason why, but it's, it's more so just access to buyers is hard. It's harder and harder and harder. Five years ago, you could pick up the phone. You may have a better success rate of getting somebody on the phone. Today, it's, it's X times negative whatever. So it's harder and access to buyers is harder. That is creating a lot of turmoil, and you're seeing this unfortunately in the industries with layoffs. And you know, it's not just the access to buyers, but it's it, or new buyers. It's ex- access to existing buyers too. It's existing customers that are their businesses are being faced with external threats. So it's it's harder to access buyers, both that are prospective as well as current. And how do you vie for time on their calendar? And that's hard whether it's new or existing. Customer success teams are still struggling today. How do you keep customer spend? How do you keep NRR going? And there's not much you can do when your clients are going from 100 users down to 50 or down to 20. And you know there's, there's just not a whole lot. So that inadvertently becomes the problem is, is access to buyers and keeping buyers' attention. So that's really what I'm, what I'm seeing is people are trying to just access buyers and continue on that pipeline, new new logo, new customer acquisition, and how do we keep that pipeline full to help protect and hedge against some of the existing revenue that we're inevitably losing because of downsizes and, and reduction in forces and stuff like that. So access to buyers is, is the probably the quintessential problem that I see every organization facing right now. Yeah, I, I got to, I agree with you 100%. What is the... Uh... I, I'm going to ask you a, a question. I know you can't answer. But what's the solution? But what's the solution? <laughs> oh, that's easy. Uh, that's so that's easy. easy. I'm, gl- I'm glad Jesus. you asked. I'm really glad you asked, Paul. Um, no, and this is uh, where I think there's... It's it's really looking at this from multiple lenses. So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about you guys for a minute because one of the things that I think gets undervalued in the whole industry is understanding partnerships. And partnerships are an extremely strategic, beneficial, but also very time-consuming activity. It's not just, let's go get some partners and all of a sudden it's going to rain. It just doesn't happen. But partnerships are a great way to get access to buyers. Think about this from a very high level is you're accessing networks that they have access to that you don't have to access. So how do you cultivate those and get into those buyer circles? So I think partnerships... Are, are is one of those solutions that I don't 
I don't believe there's any company where partnerships aren't really valuable. It's just a matter of how does it get prioritized in terms of everything else, because somebody needs to own it. Somebody needs to be responsible for it. And there needs to be constant conversation, direction, objectives, initiatives to help support the strategy. So partnerships are one uh, solution. And again, I think Membrane is doing great with how you've gone to market and how this is a pivotal part of your strategy. The second is, um, you know, kind of in tandem with, with partnerships, but also a slight separation is understanding the value of a content strategy. And that, that can do so much to, throughout so many parts of the organization. You don't have to be a SaaS company to embrace content. There are plenty of manufacturing companies, service companies that a content strategy makes sense. Content from the perspective of getting your name, your thoughts out there, getting valuable information to the market and creating that kind of high level access point into your top of funnel. Content strategy, quite frankly, is just should be valued as much of an investment as you would what I would consider an SDR channel. When you look at how do you get people into top of funnel, there's absolutely great ways to do it. So a content strategy, not just like, hey, I'm going to use ChatGPT to write some blogs and all of a sudden SEO is going to bring leads in. That's a fallacy and that will never work. But uh, an actual content strategy... Thank you for strategy, saying that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and I, and thank I you will, for saying that. I'm I hugging you battle, through the camera. Yeah. yeah, I will go to battle with anyone on that. But yeah. um, there are you know, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottle of funnel content strategy or tactics that need mm-hmm. to happen. How do you bring people into the top? How do you keep from top and move to middle? How do you bring from middle to the bottom? There's all of that that needs to be considered in that strategy. And and I feel like the demand generation landscape is 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 being under-resourced right now, under-invested in right now. And that's ultimately, I think, hurting any kind of pipeline generation. So those are two areas, partnerships, content strategies. How do you get access to buyers? Those are some great ways to do it instead of burning the phones, cold calling, cold emailing, and cold LinkedIn. Not that those are bad, but it's got to be an augmented strategy where everything is used, but there are better ways to do it to access buyers. Yeah, I, I'm finding that the uh, well, across everybody I'm talking to, that the content strategy is critical. And then the value of that content, it's... There's this interesting dichotomy that I'm seeing. Sometimes the value needs to be entertainment, right? Uh, and I think we've taken this from the media, or, but sometimes that entertainment value is massive. Like I see some of the greatest content out there is it's not informative at all, right? It, it won't tell me anything about you, but it will connect your name with a good laugh or connect your name mm-hmm. with a, a viral thing. And that's that's great. And the second I've seen is that that it the experience, that the the experience with that content. Uh, needs to provide a lot more value than it did before. Because when this whole idea of content marketing started, it was great. It was just like, oh, I got free content in my inbox. Yeah, I can watch, get all these newsletters. But I'm finding those those things are really coming to the forefront. Is that Are you seeing any sort of similarities there? Oh, before I tackle that, I want to talk about the entertainment because yeah. I think you're, you're spot on. The only the caveat to that is... Don't be too entertaining that you're forgotten. And if we think about Super Bowl ads, we can think about Super Bowl ads of like, yeah, this is the funniest ad. Well, who was it about? Uh, I don't know. So that's that's where I would say one of the best Super Bowl ads that I will go to my grave saying this was Budweiser and the frogs. And Budweiser. Why was it good? Because it was entertaining and it talked about the brand. Everybody knew Budweiser. So... The entertainment value, I'm not going to take away because that's absolutely true, is nobody wants to be communicated to through corporate stuffy professional language, right? It's got to be entertaining, mm-hmm. but it's got to be relevant. So that's the that's the caveat is to keep it on brand, keep it, you know, so people know yes. who you are and make yes. it entertaining for sure. So that's kind of one area. The other area is when you think about content, it's consumed through many different channels, I actually I just reshared a post today from a a guy that I'm connected with that I've known for a while. His name's Chuck Shaver. He's a, a trainer to sales teams that helps with social selling, and um, he made a post about you know the LinkedIn algorithm, right? And his whole thing is 
I don't chase ghosts. I'm not worried about what the algorithm will or won't do. I'm worried about providing valuable content to people who want to consume it. And as simple as that sounds, it's LinkedIn is just one channel. So don't mm-hmm. don't burn calories trying to figure out what time of day, how long should the post be? Should I put the link in the comp post or add it in the comment? All of that stuff is truly irrelevant. Why? Because LinkedIn owns that audience, not you. They own the distribution. So it's one channel, use a channel. And when it comes to content consuming, people consume it in many different areas. I don't have a right answer because it's all going to depend. But the, you know, try and focus on how do you own the audience? How do you own an audience? Well, you own it with an email address. You own it with some phone numbers. You own it through conversation and communities. That's how you, that's how you continue to own your audience. But use those other channels, those least channels to continue to drive home the value because I don't want to undermine how important those channels are, especially for companies selling to large markets, is you, you have to be where your buyer is. That's that's the age old like sales 101, right? Marketing 101 is be where your buyer is. And if they're on LinkedIn, be on LinkedIn. If they're on TikTok, be on TikTok. If they're on Instagram, be on Instagram. If they're on threads, then tell me what they're doing because I still don't understand what that's there for. <laughs> so, but 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 all in all, it's be where your buyer is and and try to drive activity. Content is a great way to engage, but don't just do content for content's sake. Have it be purposeful, and this is where really aligning towards: Am I trying to drive top of funnel activity, middle of funnel, or bottom of funnel? And make sure that you're you're taking it from that strategy approach. Otherwise, you're just using ChatGPT to write hundreds of blog posts every day that don't do anything, and all it's it's never going to change. Shoot, uh, we could continue this for the next four hours, I think, and <laughs> probably not take a breath. Uh, we'd need a bourbon and a cigar to do it well. Oh but, yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it there, and I'm gonna I would love to have you back on. It, it, are you agreeable to that? Have Heck some fun. Yeah. Heck yeah, I love like like I said, this could be hours of conversation and. We could banter into a lot of stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I hopefully this is helpful to all you listeners out there. I know I'm learning a ton, so I can guarantee that that uh, everybody else is. Well, I don't know. You may know what Ed knows. I'm learning a ton. But, Ed, how do people get in touch with you if they listen to this and want to? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my website, bluechipcro.com. And on LinkedIn, Google Ed Porter, or not Google, go on LinkedIn, search Ed Porter. It's not a whole lot of us. Although I think there is a an actor named Ed Porter that I did see him on IMDb once. So oh, there nice. is an Ed Porter. I have Googled myself. Was he playing Ed Porter? No, no. Oh, uh, well, we'll was, have to write that movie later. That'll yeah, be good. Right, That'll be a good right. one. <laughs> the evolution of a CRO. Yes. We'll make it happen. Right? Why not? Right, uh, why not? Why not? Entertainment, Why not? Entertainment right? That's, there, there you that's go. That's marketing. That's marketing. Well, no, it's been awesome having you on. I, I have really appreciate it. Everybody, if you are looking for a fractional CRO, if you're looking just for ideas on, uh, on, on getting into being a CRO or some of the things that go along that, that revenue framework, I highly encourage you to reach out to Ed. He's a uh, great guy to hang around, great guy to smoke a cigar with. And uh, it's just a, always a, always an amazing conversation. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it so much. On behalf of Ed and I, thank you for listening to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. And until next time, keep shining bright. We'll see you later. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This podcast is sponsored by Membrane and our partners from around the globe. Here at Membrane, we believe that B2B sales is at a crossroads. Due to decades of quantity-based prospecting, information overload, and really a shift towards efficiency over service and pitching over leadership in sales, customers are saying enough is enough. They're tuning out average performers and choosing to take most of the buying journey on their own. This results in up and down sales results, forecasts that are all over the place, and salespeople that are half committed due to the fact that they're having poor results and they have an inability to truly connect with customers. We believe the road successful companies are taking to combat this is threefold. Number one, training to create leaders and executives across all areas of the team with strong habits and sales methodologies that bring value. Number two, technology. Technology that focuses and helps a salesperson succeed and reinforces great habits. 
rather than wasting their time on filling out fields for reporting or wasting their time on spamming customers that have no interest in ever buying. Third, talent. And I'm talking about talent that's empowered and emboldened to make a difference for their customers and their companies. So where are you on that journey? Membrane and our network of partners across the globe are here to help and to elevate the sales profession. We streamline critical technology by combining CRM, training and enablement, and more into one seamless platform. We drive best-in-class methodologies through our partners. They provide the top thought leadership methodologies and resources from across the globe. And our collective efforts are dedicated to recruiting, training, coaching, and empowering, and measuring the habits of the top teams in the world to ensure success. Join us at Membrane.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening.